Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of Cutrate Commander, the series in which we take a look at low price commanders and make budget decks with them. My name is Granzit and today we'll be looking at the samurai who slayed Nicobolus, Tetsuo Imperial Champion. But before we continue, be sure to like, comment, and subscribe if you like this content and would like me to continue making more videos like this in the future. And if you're feeling particularly generous, please consider buying me a coffee at the link in the description to keep me caffeinated as I work on more of these builds. Also, be sure to stick around until the end of the video to see who won last week's poll and what commanders you'll be voting for for an upcoming episode. So with that out of the way, let's start by taking a look at the commander and playstyle. Tetsuo Imperial Champion is a 3-3 human samurai that costs a blue, a black, and a red and has the following ability. Whenever Tetsuo Imperial Champion attacks, choose one. Tetsuo deals damage equal to the highest CMC among equipment attached to him to any target, or we may cast an instant or sorcery from our hand of CMC less than or equal to the highest CMC among equipment attached to Tetsuo without paying its mana cost. Breaking down his core stats, Tetsuo possesses a mid-size CMC, a typical stat block for his cost, and an ability that allows him to get even more value out of any equipment we suit him up with in the form of extra damage or free spells. Taking a closer look at his ability's first mode, it tacks on a solid bit of targeted damage as Tetsuo swings in, on average throwing out between 2 and 4 damage a turn per swing depending on what he's equipped with. And because this damage is dealt by Tetsuo himself, it also benefits from any keywords he possesses, such as Death Touch to turn it into a targeted removal effect for creatures, or Life Link to give us even more life back per turn. And since this occurs on each attack, it becomes even better if we can get additional combat phases, which the red part of his color identity can easily enable. Then looking at his ability second mode, it trades away the extra damage for free spells instead, allowing us to cast a chosen spell from hand as he swings in while ignoring timing and casting restrictions. And while yes, we'll typically be limited to lower CMC spells as most equipment worth running caps out at around CMC 3 or 4 until the late game, there are still plenty of spells that can make use of this ability, such as suspend spells with no mana cost, which Tetsuo can cast immediately without having to suspend them first, and well costed removal and draw that are great riders to add to his attacks to pick off threats or net us more resources. So, as we can see from his abilities, Tetsuo is an equipment-focused commander that not only cares about the equipment he's equipped with, but also the spells we have so he can cast them for free. Which is why in this build we'll be combining both aspects into an equipment-focused spell slinger build. Taking a look at the equipment side of things, we'll of course be running plenty of low to mid-range equipment to get on Tetsuo quickly to allow him to proc his ability, providing him with raw stats as well as keywords that synergize well with his on-damage effect, as well as more defensive options to keep him alive for longer, which will cap off with some high CMC entrance to kick his stats and ability into overdrive in the late game, all of which will be supported by plenty of artifact and equipment matters payoffs to generate us even more value. Then on to the spell singing side of things, we'll be running a decent number of CMC0 suspend spells that our commander can cheat out for us, in addition to low and mid range CMC spells that provide card selection and card advantage to help us dig deeper into our deck for more powerful equipment, and plenty of well costed removal and wipes to help us deal with our opponent's board states if they start getting out of control. And lastly, we'll be running a handful of extra combat phase sources to allow Tetsuo to swing in more often, and get even more mileage out of his ability once he's been suited up. So let's take a step back and witness the martial and magical prowess that made Tetsuo Umezawa into a legend. While his story may have begun with him being an unwitting vassal of Bolas, it ended with him not only slaying Ramses Overdark, the legendary Imperial Assassin and Regent to Bolas, but casting down the mighty Dragon Emperor himself in single combat, freeing the Empire of Medora from his tyrannical rule. And should any other power-hungry planeswalker threaten his homeland again, he will not hesitate to raise his legendary blade against them as well. So, now that we know a bit more about the commander and playstyle, let's start looking at the deck itself by starting with the creatures. Skipping straight to the CMC2 slot, the first half brings us a suite of reconfigured creatures with Blade of the Oni, Lizard Blades, and the Reality Chip. Blade of the Oni is a 3-1 with Menace and reconfigure for 2 and double black that turns the equipped creature into a base 5-5 with Menace that's also a black demon in addition to its other types, making it a relatively cheap body to drop early that we can later use to provide Tetsuo with plus 2 plus 2 and evasion. Lizard Blades is a 1-1 with Double Strike and Reconfigure 2 that grants the equipped creature Double Strike, providing us with a very cheap way to double Tetsuo's damage output that also works very nicely with our Death Touch and Life Link sources as well. The Reality Chip is a 0-4 with Reconfigure for 2 and a blue that lets us look at the top card of our deck at any time and, when equipped, also lets us play and or cast the top card of our deck, 
Its future sight-like effect when equipped, netting us a solid amount of card advantage by effectively turning the top card of our deck into an extra card in hand that always replaces itself. The latter half of this slot then brings us some Artifact Matters cards in the form of Joyra Ageless Innovator, Enthusiastic Mechanaut, and Ethereum Sculptor. Joy raises a 2-3 that lets us tap her and put two Ingenuity counters on her and then lets us put an artifact from our hand into play of CMC less than or equal to the number of Ingenuity counters on her, giving us a repeatable way to cheat our artifacts into play that hits bigger and bigger artifacts over time. Enthusiastic Mechanaut and Ethereum Sculptor both reduce the cost of all our artifact spells by one, the former being a 2-2 flyer while the latter is a 1-2, both serving as cheap means to reduce the cost of our equipment and other artifacts to help get them on board even faster. It's then on to the CMC3 slot and another pair of equipment creatures with Acquisition Octopus and Kameno Battle Armor. Acquisition Octopus is a 2-2 with Reconfigure for 2 that, whenever it or the equipped creature deals combat damage to a player, draws us a card, providing us with a steady stream of card advantage as Tetsuo gets in for damage, and working well alongside our sources of double strike and extra combat phases to provide even more draw. Kameinu Battle Armor is another 2-2, this time with Menace and Reconfigure for 4 that gives the equipped creature plus 2 plus 2 and Menace, and, whenever it or the equipped creature deals combat damage to a player, goads each creature that player controls. The stat bump and evasion it grants being nice on their own, but its ability to mass disrupt our opponent's board state being a fantastic way to leave them open for follow-up attacks. The Legend Dalakos Crafter of Wonders then also gets added in, being a 2-4 we can tap for 2 colorless that we may only spend on artifact spells and abilities, in addition to giving all equipped creatures we control flying in haste, making him a solid source of mana to help cast and attach our equipment, as well as a solid payoff afterwards to make Tetsuo hasty and evasive as we suit him up. Then we wrap up this slot with the artifact creatures Brass Squire and Burnished Heart. Brass Squire is a 1-3 we can tap to attach target equipment we control to target creature we control, giving us a superb way to cheat on equipment cost for some of our larger pieces of equipment so we can get them on Tetsuo faster. Burnished Heart is a 2-2 we can pay 3 in sack to put 2 basic lands from our deck into play tapped, providing our build with some solid land based ramp to help both speed up and fix our 3 color mana base. Then entering the CMC4 slot, we have its only entrant, Deadeye Quartermaster. A 2-2 that, when it ETBs, has us search our deck for any equipment or vehicle, reveal it, and put it into our hand, serving as a reliable way for us to tutor up any specific equipment we may need or want. Nearing the end now, the CMC5 slot brings us another single entrant, Karlak Fury of Avernus. A 5-4 that, whenever we attack, if it's our first combat phase that turn, untaps all our creatures, gives them first strike until end of turn, and grants us an additional combat phase after the current one, making her a reliable source of extra combat phases to get more value out of Tetsuo, and whose AoE first strike granting is also very useful to enable safer attacks if we have no other first strike or double striking options. Then finally reaching the CMC6 slot, we have our last pair of creatures with Aki Battle Squad and Godo Bandit Warlord. Aki Battle Squad is a 6-6 that, whenever one or more modified creatures we control attacks, untaps all modified creatures we control and grants us an additional combat phase after the current one, limited to once each turn, again giving us another repeatable source of extra combat phases on a pretty sizable body to swing in with alongside our commander. Godo is a 3-3 that, when he ETBs, has a search our deck for any equipment and puts it into play, in addition to, the first time he attacks each turn, untaps all samurai we control and grants us an additional combat phase after the current one, his ETB allowing us to cheat our biggest equipment directly into play, while being yet another source of extra combat phases to get even more mileage out of Tetsuo's ability. That covers all our creatures, so let's move on to our instance. Starting off in the CMC1 slot, we only have a single entry, Brainstorm, which lets us draw three, then put two cards from our hand on top of our deck in any order, making it a cheap source of card selection that really helps out the deck's consistency, especially in the early game to help us make our land drops. It's then on to the CMC2 slot, which consists of the removal suite, a braid, Rakdos Charm, and Terminate. A braid has us choose one of the following effects, deal 3 damage to target creature or destroy target artifact, providing us with a flexible removal option that deals with both front row and back row threats. Rakdos Charm also has us choose one of the following effects, exile target player's graveyard, destroy target artifact, or have each creature deal 1 damage to its controller. 
all its modes being very playable depending on the circumstance. Whether that be dealing with graveyard-focused builds, taking out annoying artifacts, or sometimes winning us the game on the spot against wide board states. Terminate destroys target creature and prevents it from regenerating, making it a no-frills creature removal spell that helps us deal with bodies too big for Tetsuo to handle on his own if he's not properly equipped. And finally, reaching the CMC3 slot and our last trio of instants, we have Chaos Warp, Bedevil, and Krosis Charm. Chaos Warp has a shuffle target permanent back into its owner's deck, then has its owner reveal a top card from it, letting them put it into play if it's a permanent, providing our build with an incredibly versatile removal option that's capable of dealing with a wide variety of threats despite its downside. Bedevil destroys target artifact, creature, or planeswalker. Not being quite as flexible as the previous entry, but still hitting a wide variety of common threats, this time with no downside. Krosis Charm has us choose one of the following effects. Return target permanent to its owner's hand, destroy target non-black creature and prevent it from regenerating, or destroy target artifact. Again, giving us another adaptable piece of removal to deal with a wide variety of threats as needed. That covers all our instants, so let's move on to our sorceries. Beginning in the CMC Zero slot, we start off with the suite of Suspend Spells, Ancestral Vision, Profane Tutor, and Wheel of Fate. The first having Suspend 4 for a blue and letting target player draw 3. The second having Suspend 2 for 1 in a black and letting us search our deck for any card and putting it into our hand. And the last having Suspend 4 for 1 in a red and has each player discard their hand and draw 7 cards. All of which our commander can cheat into play for us and bypass their Suspend entirely so long as he's equipped with anything. Allowing us to take advantage of the draw, tutor, and wheel effect they provide without having to wait any turns to do so. Inevitable Betrayal also gets added into this slot, having Suspend for 1 in double blue and lets us search target opponent's deck for a creature card and put it into play under our control. In this build, serving as a 0 mana bribery, with the only requirement being swinging in with Tetsuo while he's equipped. Then moving on to the CMC1 slot, we have its two members, Preordain and Serum Visions, both of which draw us a card and scry two, the former scrying two before the draw while the latter does so afterwards, making them cheap means to dig through our deck for better equipment and spells as Tetsuo swings in. It's then on to the CMC2 slot and its pair of mono black entrants, Feed the Swarm and Sign in Blood. Feed the Swarm destroys target creature or enchantment an opponent controls, then has us lose life equal to its CMC, providing the build with a reliable way to deal with enchantments whose life loss isn't too impactful to us considering how much life gain Tetsuo provides us with once he's suited up with life-linking equipment. Sign in Blood has target player draw 2 and lose 2 life, making it a cheap source of card advantage that's easily castable off Tetsuo as he swings in to help replenish our hands. Then skipping to the CMC4 slot, the first half brings us the card advantage sources, one with the machine, and siphon mind. One with the machine draws us cards equal to the highest CMC artifact we control, usually drawing us between 3 and 4 cards, which is about on rate, but can draw us up to 6 and 7 with our biggest equipment in play to completely reload our hands in the late game. Siphon Mind has each opponent discard a card, then has us draw a card for each card discarded this way, making it a decent source of card advantage that also denies our opponent's resources as a bonus. The latter half of this slot then brings us Anchor to Reality and Storm's Wrath. Anchor to Reality has a sack a creature or artifact to search our deck for an equipment or vehicle and put it into play, also scrying two if the CMC of the card fetched is less than the one sacked, allowing us to transmute our low CMC equipment and rocks into our most powerful pieces of equipment, improving our deck's consistency considerably. Storm's Wrath deals 4 damage to each creature and each planeswalker, making it a decent wrath that deals with big board states of up to medium sized creatures effectively, while also leaving Tetsuo alive once he's been properly suited up, with the added benefit of also hitting planeswalkers as a bonus. And finally, reaching the CMC5 slot and our last pair of sorceries, we have Burn Down the House and Hour of Devastation, both of which deal 5 damage to all creatures and planeswalkers, the former alternatively letting us create 3 1 1 devil tokens that deal 1 damage to any target when they die, and the latter also removing indestructible from all creatures before the damage and being limited to non bolus planeswalkers. Again, allowing us to wipe most boards of creatures and walkers while leaving a suited up Tetsuo relatively unscathed after the dust settles. That covers all our sorceries, and with no enchantments to cover in this build, let's move straight to our artifacts. 
Beginning in the CMC1 slot, we start off with the ramp sources Soul Ring and Wayfarer's Bobble. The former tapping for two colorless, and the latter letting us pay two, tap it in sackets to put a basic land from our deck into play tapped, each helping us speed up and or fix our mana base respectively. Then we end this slot with the equipment Basilisk Collar and Vorpal Sword, both of which grant the equipped creature Death Touch, the former equipping for two and also granting lifelink, and the latter equipping for double black, giving the equipped creature plus two plus zero, and letting us pay five and triple black two until end of turn, have any player dealt damage by the equipped creature lose the game. Their death touch granting allowing Tetsuo to destroy any creature with his first ability, while the lifelink and player elimination they provide are useful to pad our life totals or to pressure our opponents. Proceeding to the CMC2 slot, we're back on the ramp game plan with our Mana Rock Suite, which consists of Arcane Signet, which taps for any color in our commander's color identity, Demir Signet, Izzet Signet, and Rakdos Signet, all of which we can pay one and tap to produce a combination of two of our colors, and Felwar Stone, which taps for any color an opponent's land would be able to produce, providing our build with even more ways to speed up and fix our mana base so we can get to our higher CMC spells even faster. Then the rest of this slot is equipment all the way down, starting with Black Blade Reforged, Conqueror's Flail, and a Mask of Riddles. Black Blade Reforged either equips for 7 or 3 instead if the creature being equipped is legendary, and grants the equipped creature plus 1 plus 1 for each land we control, providing Tetsuo with a scaling stat increase that becomes bigger and bigger as the game progresses, on its own bringing him up to 1 to 2 shot range by mid to late game. Conqueror's Flail equips for 2, grants the equipped creature plus 1 plus 1 for each color among permanents we control, and prevents our opponents from casting spells during our turn so long as it's equipped, its plus 3 plus 3 stat bump being very solid for its cost, and its ability to turn off our opponent's spell casting on our turn making it very difficult for them to react to our plays before it's far too late. Mask of Riddles grants the equipped creature fear and draws us a card whenever it deals combat damage to a player, granting Tetsuo or any other equipped creature reliable evasion to bypass most blockers, and on damage draw that again works well with our double strike and extra combat sources. Then we wrap up this slot with the more defense-oriented equipment Mask of Avacyn, Swiftfoot Boots, and Winged Boots. The first equipping for 3 and granting the equipped creature plus 1 plus 2 and Hexproof, the second equipping for 1 and granting the equipped creature Hexproof and Haste, and the last also equipping for 1 and granting the equipped creature Ward 4 and Flying, primarily serving as cheap means to passively protect Tetsuo from removal with Upside. It's then equipment all the way down for the remainder of this category, with the CMC3 slot starting us off with Loxodon Warhammer and Sword of Vengeance, both of which equip for 3, the former granting the equipped creature plus 3 plus 0 Trample and Lifelink, and the latter granting it plus 2 plus 0 First Strike, Vigilance, Trample and Haste, each providing our commander with decent offensive stat boost and trample to more reliably get in for damage, as well as other relevant keywords to make him even deadlier. Tenza Goto's Maul then joins us as another trample granting equipment, which equips for 1, grants the equipped creature plus 1 plus 1, an additional plus 2 plus 2 if it's red, and trample if it's legendary, giving Tetsuo a solid plus 3 plus 3 stat bump and trample on a very easy to equip piece of equipment. Two handed axe then also gets added into our weapon arsenal, being an adventure card whose adventure side, Sweeping Cleave, is an instant for 1 in a red that grants target creature double strike until end of turn, and whose equipment side equips for 1 in a red and doubles the equipped creature's power when whenever it attacks until end of turn. It's adventure side working nicely to double up on our damage output out of nowhere, and, when equipped, brings Tetsuo's power to one-shot territory, especially when combined with our extra combat phases. We then have the Equipment Matters, Bearded Axe, and Nettle Cyst slotting into our build as well, both of which equip for two, the former granting the equipped creature plus one plus one for each equipment dwarf and or vehicle we control, and the latter having Living Weapon and granting the equipped creature plus one plus one for each artifact and or enchantment we control instead, each being more than capable of providing a massive stat increase that fits very well with our artifact and equipment heavy play style. We then close out this slot with the card advantage source Robe of the Arch Magi, which equips for 4 and, whenever the equipped creature deals combat damage to a player, draws us cards equal to that amount, effectively reloading our hands every time Tetsuo attacks once he's suited up for an insane amount of card advantage per swing. Now entering the CMC4 slot, we add its two entries to our arsenal, those being Packed Weapon and Unsythe Killer of Kings. Packed Weapon equips by discarding a card, prevents us from losing the game at 0 life or less when equipped, and, whenever the equipped creature attacks, has a straw and reveal the top card of our deck, having the equipped creature gain plus x plus x until end of turn while we lose x life, where x is equal to the revealed card CMC. 
providing us with some decent card advantage and stat increases as we swing in, which again works well with our extra combat phases without affecting our life totals too much since we have easy access to lifelink, and whose loss prevention can occasionally buy us the extra time we need to either win or at least stabilize our life totals in a pinch. Unsight Killer of Kings equips for 2, grants the equipped creature plus 3 plus 3 in first strike, and whenever a creature that's dealt damage by the equipped creature goes to the graveyard, lets us exile it and create a 2-2 zombie token, giving our commander a sizable stat boost and relevant keyword right out of the gate, and its token creation working nicely with Tetsuo's targeted damage ability, especially when combined with Death Touch granting sources to exile any creature and get us a token in the exchange. Entering the CMC5 slot now, we come to its single entrant, Batter Skull, which has Living Weapon, equips for 5, grants the equipped creature plus 4 plus 4 Vigilance and Lifelink, and lets us pay 3 to return it to our hand. Initially coming down with its own body thanks to Living Weapon so we don't have to worry about equipping it, and, once we get it on Tetsuo, provides him with a solid stat boost and very relevant keywords to allow him to block incoming attacks and pad our life totals with his improved bulk. Nearing the end of our artifacts now, the CMC6 slot brings us the removal options Argentum Armor and Drachnian. The former equipping for 6, granting the equipped creature plus 6 plus 6, and whenever the equipped creature attacks, exiles target permanent, and the latter equipping for 2, when it ETBs, exiles target creature and grants the equipped creature plus X plus 0 and menace, where X is equal to the exiled creature's power, giving our build some very solid exile-based removal while also working very well with Tetsuo to have him cheat out CMC6 or lower spells or deal 6 damage to anything per swing. And finally, reaching the CMC7 slot and our last equipment, we have Cauldra Complete, which has Living Weapon, is indestructible, equips for 7, and grants the equipped creature plus 5 plus 5, first strike, trample, indestructible, and haste, along with, whenever it deals combat damage to a creature, exiles that creature, providing Tetsuo with solid protection, a massive stat increase, and a whole host of relevant keywords, with the added benefit of being very easy to tutor up or cheat into play in this build, even coming into play with its own body in case we don't have the mana to equip it to Tetsuo right away. That covers all our artifacts, and since we have no planeswalkers in this build, let's move straight to our land base. Starting off with our mana lands, we have Command Tower, which taps for any color in our commander's color identity, Exotic Orchard, which taps for any color an opponent's land would be able to produce, Grumbling Necropolis, which comes into play tapped and taps for any of our colors, Choked Estuary, Foreboding Ruins, and Frostboil Snarl, all of which come into play tapped unless we reveal a basic land type of the mana they can produce and tap for one of two of our colors. Smoldering Marsh and Sunken Hollow, both of which come into play tapped unless we control two plus basic lands, tap for one of two of our colors, in addition to having the basic land types of the mana they can produce. Shiv and Reef, which either taps for a colorless or a blue or red instead if we take a damage. Myriad Landscape, which comes into play tapped, taps for a colorless and lets us pay two, tap it and sack it to put two of the same basic land from our deck into play tapped. And finally Maestro's Theater, Evolving Wilds, and Terramorphic Expanse, all of which we can sack to put a basic land from our deck into play tapped, the first doing so when it ETBs and gaining us a life, while the latter two can be tapped to do so. Then for our utility lands, we'll be running Bajuga Bog and Rogue's Passage. Bajuga Baga comes into play tapped, taps for a black, and exiles target player's graveyard when it ETBs, making it a solid source of graveyard hate from our land slot to hose any graveyard-focused builds we may encounter. Rogue's Passage taps for a colorless and lets us pay for and tap it to make target creature unblockable until the end of the turn, working nicely with Tetsuo to allow him to safely attack into big boards if he has no evasion of his own, or alpha strike an opponent who may be able to intercept our other forms of evasion. And lastly, we're running 7 islands, 6 swamps, and 7 mountains as our basics to close out our land base. So, now that we've covered all the cards in the deck, let's take a look at this deck's breakdown. This deck currently has 16 creatures including the commander, 7 instants, 14 sorceries, 0 enchantments, 28 artifacts, 0 planeswalkers, and 35 lands. Looking at the stats that matter to our game plan, we have 26 pieces of equipment, a total of 21 instants and sorceries, 6 cards that care about artifacts, 6 cards that care about equipment, 8 sources of trample slash evasion, 4 sources of protection against targeting or removal, and 3 sources of extra combat phases, giving us plenty of equipment and spells to work with Tetsuo's ability, plenty of payoffs for our equipment to make them easier to search up and cast, a good number of which grant keywords to allow our commander to get in for damage reliably, or alternatively to keep him alive for as long as possible, and capping off with a handful of extra combat-based generators to allow us to get more uses out of Tetsuo's ability as he swings in. 
For general deck stats, we have 12 ramp sources, 10 car draw sources, 11 targeted removal sources, and 3 board wipes, leaving us with a fairly typical ratio of core stats with no real outliers. Looking at our mana curve, we have 4 0 drops, 7 1 drops, 22 2 drops, 16 3 drops, 7 4 drops, 4 5 drops, 4 6 drops, and 1 7 drop leaving us with a somewhat aggressive curve that aims to get Tetsuo out quickly, then load him up with powerful equipment and have him swing in to cast free spells for us or deal extra damage until he's able to win through commander damage. Currently, this deck is valued at $64.90, not counting the price of basic lands or shipping. This price was calculated by using the cheapest listed marketplace price on TCG Player at the time of this recording. For side grades, Padim Console of Innovation is a good source of card advantage and protection that works well with our artifact heavy build. Ponder and Frantic Search are both good low cost spells to cheat out with Tetsuo to help us dig deeper into our deck for more resources, and Relentless Assault is yet another way to get extra combat phases, this time castable off Tetsuo for free. For upgrades, Dark Steel Plate and Lightning Greaves are excellent low cost defensive equipment to keep Tetsuo alive, as are Hammer of Nazan and Champion's Helm if we want to go up a price bracket. Seize the Day is another good source of extra combat phases that we can get two uses out of thanks to Flashback. Chandra's Ignition is a superb board wipe that also benefits from any relevant keywords Tetsuo may possess. Ember Cleave is a great way to grant our commander surprise double strike and trample. Oathkeeper Takano's Dai Show is a great way to auto res Tetsuo along with providing a decent stat boost for the cost. And Sword of the Animist and the Reaver Cleaver are both excellent equipable sources of repeatable ramp. And of course, any of the swords would be a great addition to the build for the great protection they provide and powerful on attack abilities, though expect these blades to cut as deep into our pockets as they do into our opponents. Thanks everyone for sticking around until the end of the video. Firstly, I'd like to thank the channel subs again for helping the channel crack its 7.3k sub milestone. Thank you all for your continued support, as this channel would be unable to grow without it. Then taking a look at the results of last week's poll, it looks like Shauna has made Sisse proud by claiming the top spot, so look forward to a life gain focused build featuring her next week. Then moving on to this week's poll, the rare and mythic commanders have had it too good for too long, so it's time to shine the spotlight on some of the uncommon commanders this time around. With this week's contenders consisting of the ex-ship mage of the Weatherlight, Raph Weatherlight Stalwart, the half-elf Lanawar Noble, Queen Elenol of Rudok, and back for a second round, the newly completed Ellis Elcor Sadistic Pilgrim. Please cast your vote in the community tab, link in the description, and let me know in the comments who you voted for and what commanders you want to see from Dominaria United in future polls. Before we close out, again, be sure to like, comment, and subscribe if you haven't done so already, as this channel cannot grow without your support. And if you feel like showing your thanks by keeping me caffeinated while I make these videos, please consider buying me a coffee at the link in the description. And speaking of which, I'd like to thank Bow and Arrow for their generous donation. Thanks for the coffee, Bow and Arrow, and thank you for supporting the channel. And if any of you would like to support the channel in a different way, feel free to check out the other deck techs floating around my head if you'd like to see the latest builds, or click on the link above for for a playlist of all the cut rate commander episodes I've made so far. And with that, have a good one folks, and stay safe.